I believe. Had she been on that voyage across the North Atlantic on April the 14th of 1912, was it, when the Titanic, she would not, she would not have sunk. The outstanding thing about this ship is what the Navy calls the power of survival. It is the power that the ship has of staying afloat and not burning up in case of an accident, collision, or a fire breaking out on board. They never called her unsinkable, but had she been put to the test, I would venture to say that she'd have a much better chance of surviving. They used to joke torpedoes could practically bounce off the sides of the ship. The ship was a five compartment ship, as opposed to today's two compartment ships, and the new standard that's being introduced of three compartment. You could flood five of the largest compartments of this vessel up to the waterline and it would still float and not sink. The United States had great strength and great ability to endure collision, even with an iceberg. My grandfather was an absolute fanatic when it came to fire safety. It was a completely fireproof ship. People who traveled aboard the French line ships and the English ships back in the 50s and 60s, they got on the United States and they couldn't find any wood to knock on for good luck. You know, they were like, where's the wood? Aesthetically, it was, it was a shock to us. The wood, I think, added so much to the charm of the ship which the SS United States didn't have. It was loaded with asbestos, which was, of course, a miracle material at the time the ship was being built. So she was advertised as the most fireproof ocean liner afloat. Even the bedspreads and drapes were fire retardant, which when you consider in the early 50s, it's quite a little coup to produce those. But that's the kind of ship of genius she was. Every detail was American brilliance. The famous story is the only wood on the, the ship. The only wood on board. The only wood. The only thing that would burn on that ship. Was the butcher's block. The butcher blocks. The chopper's block. And in the pianos. Piano and the butcher's block. Gibbs actually tried to get Steinway to manufacture an aluminum piano. Steinway was just about ready to build him this aluminum piano, but he said, let me give you a demonstration, and poured gasoline over it and tried to ignite it, and it wouldn't burn. Gibbs relented, and uh, the ship was equipped with a uh, wooden Steinway piano. And I can only imagine what social life on the ship would have been had he not allowed pianos on board. A modern day cruise ship, most of them go about 20 knots. The United States could do that in reverse. The power plant was the same power plant they put into an aircraft carrier. More aluminum has been used in the United States than in any other structure ever built. All shafting is hollow board to save weight. The same strength can be obtained with a considerably lighter section. So the ship could travel extraordinarily fast. Debate continues to rage over the ship's top speed. Because it's one of those um, mythical subjects that all fans of this ship talk about when they get together. We cruised at 32 and a half knots. At full bore, she could do 38 knots plus. I've heard lots of different figures bandied about. 40 miles an hour at the size it is. 45 knots during her trials, that's almost 55 miles an hour. I mean, that's flying across the sea. And we all try to keep it keep it real and honest. She could go 50 miles an hour. I know what I would like it to be. 36, 40, 42 knots, that's pretty amazing. There are those who claim to have been on the ship when she was doing 40 knots. They kicked her up to about 42 knots on her maiden voyage, and you could feel it. People say that she went as fast as 50 knots. Her absolute top speed for two hours during her sea trials in the spring of 52 was 43 knots, which is about 46 miles an hour. But that would take huge amounts of power and fuel consumption. And then she did 39 knots on her maiden voyage. Which is Damn fast. There are those who say the ship could do 50 knots. I've heard it. She made an excess of 50 knots. No one really knows how fast she could go. I think there was a hesitancy at the time to demonstrate to the world how fast the ship could go. All eight boilers on board the ship were never fully opened up. She was never really let loose. Wow, she must be fast. She's got some really big stacks. She was the quintessential symbol of America in the heyday of the 1950s post-World War II. She floats as only she can Proud and majestic is she the Colors her grandeur none can compare Could you picture her on the high seas? 
Just imagine the whistle blowing so loud that it resonated off the West Side Highway and the cobblestone streets and the checkered cabs delivering the passengers and steamer trunks going through the piers. Imagine the waiters and bellboys grabbing the boarding passes and bringing the passengers to their room for the first time. Traveling across the Atlantic on the SS United States was like being at the Waldorf Astoria or the Ritz-Carlton or, you know, the, the finest luxury hotel. There was a ratio of one crew member to every one or two passengers, so there were just teams of people to ensure that passengers uh, traveled in the utmost comfort. The champagne was flowing and the glasses were tinkling and the music was playing and it was just the scene of utmost elegance and glamour. You were going to be taken care of, you were going to eat, you were going to drink, you were going to dance, you were going to have sophisticated conversations. They used to say you could eat off the floor plates, and I think I did because I gained about 10 or 15 pounds. And how the people, the personnel, how they're dressed, they're snappy and clean and white. What a sight it was to see all these men confident, knowing that these passengers were going to come aboard and we were going to do everything to give them a good trip, a good meal, and to make their experience aboard the SS United States one that they would never forget. Everything was silver service in the dining room. You could order anything in your room, any time of the night, whatever you felt like having. If you were a child in the SS United States, the staff treated you like gold. They treated you like an adult. A deck steward came up to me and asked me if I wanted anything. And I don't know what possessed me, but I just all of a sudden I said, I'd like a sirloin steak. And my mother looked at me and she was mortified. And uh, sure enough, about 15 minutes later, sirloin steak showed up. And I thought to myself, this is good, this will work. You simply don't see that degree of service uh, and uh, style uh, today. And that's just a function of uh, the age, which is unfortunately past. The SS United States had passengers that would change their outfits seven, eight times a day. They changed for breakfast, they changed after breakfast, they changed for lunch, they changed after lunch. They changed for supper, they changed theirs to supper, and then wore a different gown and a different tuxedo every night. And you just knew right then that you were people that wasn't your normal type of people. A cartwheel hat of bamboo casts a shadow on its wearer as Fashions USA take a bow on board our new superliner, the United States. These top deck vacation fashions were created by Nat Kaplan to honor the maiden voyage of America's new queen of the sea. When you shuffle up a bit of shuffleboard, the sun's glare will be stylishly ousted with these seagoing sunglasses. When the door opened up and I saw Bert Lancaster, the, the first thing that just broke loose was Bert. <laughs> the passenger list of the SS United States was just a who's who of the the rich, the famous, the fabulous back in the 50s and 60s. Kings and queens were the guests of the time. Persons of fortune and fame. Can you recall the time that was when the whole world would utter her name? She's a symbol of America built with American hands. She cuts through the seas with a she still holds the blue ribbon, flagship of our nation. I can't ever hear the United States without being triggered back to how my whole life changed, you know? The ship in the beginning of the French Connection, the movie that brought the drugs that caused all the folderol, came over on the SS United States. You're interviewing me because the French Connection drugs came over to this country in a Buick Invicta that was on board the United States. The United States was instrumental in helping me and Eddie make this case. They gave me from the manifest how much the car weighed when it first was put on the SS United States. They went to the people from Buick and found out what a Buick weighs, and it was exactly like 112 pounds heavier when they put it on the SS United States. So we knew that the drugs had to be in the car somewhere.
And the next scene is they're going eh, with screws and taking out the rocker panels. My name is Charles Anderson. Uh, my father was Commodore John W. Anderson, who served as master of the ship from 1952 to 1964, uh, the longest serving master aboard the SS United States. I remember very vividly coming down the West Side Highway in Manhattan, seeing the ship for the first time and turning into Pier 86, which was at that time a really bustling, active pier with longshoremen carrying cargo and passengers coming out and bands playing. So it was a very exciting experience for a young boy. And then uh, once we got on board, of course, uh, going up in the elevator to the master's quarters and seeing my, my dad there in uniform. On the way back to uh, the States in 1944, he carried a passenger uh, a whack uh, lieutenant who was coming back from England who later became his wife. In memory, you go back to the day when you commanded the Ericsson and first met Mary. Could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, well, uh, I met her and I fell in love with her. <laughs> I married her. <laughs> I was just telling my son I wish that we could go back to those days so he'd have an opportunity to uh, stand on that bridge also. I didn't actually get to meet my grandfather. And I feel like now that I've seen the ship, I've actually kind of met him in a way, and that just makes me feel good. Visit SaveTheUnitedStates.org to take part in the restoration of the SS United States in a very personal way. From your web browser at SaveTheUnitedStates.org, you can explore a detailed rendering of the ship and zoom in to select the piece of the ship you wish to save for only $1 per square inch. You can personalize your part of the ship by posting your own images and words. In addition, you can even select badges and colors to make your piece of the ship stand out. Once your donation is complete, you can share your creation through Facebook, Twitter, or email, allowing friends and family to link directly to your piece of the ship and start their own journey. As you explore the ship, see who else has joined the effort, view their photos, and read about their personal connections to the United States. Search every inch of the ship and find interesting facts about various onboard locations and explore our interactive timeline to gain a better understanding of the ship's rich history. Going beyond your donation, anything you discover at SaveTheUnitedStates.org can be shared through social media to help spread the word. A simple $1 donation can save a specific piece of America's flagship for yourself, your children, or your grandchildren. You can start right now from your computer. Go to SaveTheUnitedStates.org to help restore America's flagship. Remember, save the United States .org. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 